Welcome to Writing Black Joy Season 2. I am Sophia Robinson and I'm a writing coach and an editor and a story listener as well as the producer of Writing Black Joy, a virtual space that celebrates, centers, and promotes the voices of black writers and storytellers with joyful and uplifting stories. Here, you'll find conversations with some of my favorite Black writers and storytellers, learn more about their projects and the joy they're bringing into the world, hear more about their creative process, and find inspiration for your own creative ventures, as well as tips and strategies for writing poetry, blogs, creative nonfiction, fiction, plays, and so much more from all types of writers, as well as a sneak peek into the writing life. You can even find your next favorite writer, book, poem, play, or blog. And if you are a Black writer who is looking for a coach or an editor to help you bring your joyful story into the world, then click on my website below to find out how to work with me. In the meantime, let's go to today's guest. Today's guest is Kathleen Natea. And she is an editor, a podcaster, and a writer of speculative fiction. And she has joined me to talk all about editing. So if you have any plans of getting your work out there as a writer, this conversation is a must listen. As my guest last week, Don Michelle Hardy said, editing is non-negotiable in that process. And by the way, if you have not listened to last week's episode, you need to go and take a listen. It is gold for anyone who is writing or planning to write a book. Anyway, Kathleen and I go deep into talking about editing, what the editing process is and what it isn't, and how having the right editor can make your work better and improve your writing. We talk about how to choose an editor, the questions to ask, and how to advocate for yourself during the editing process. We even get a bit nerdy talking about how language has evolved over time and also what ableist language is or can be and how an editor can help to ensure that your use of language keeps you true to your intentions for your story as well as the nuance involved, particularly in writing fiction or memoir. And we talk about different types of editing and when to bring in that type of support. Now, as I mentioned, Kathleen's also a writer of speculative fiction, so we talk about her own writing practice and how a book by Octavia Butler changed her life, as well as her podcast, Loud in the Theatre. This conversation is so full of wisdom and about the importance of editing in terms of writing and publishing your work, and I think it's a must listen for anyone who wants to write and bring that story into the world. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Writing Black Joy season two. I should say welcome back. I'm Sophia and I'm your host. Uh, I'm the podcast developer. Yes, we've got a podcast now. We've got a YouTube channel now. And today I am joined by the lovely Kathleen Natea. And she is a speculative fiction writer, a freelance editor, podcast creator and producer. All the things. I love it when they come like that. And her experience as a Black American woman living with a disability informs the way she both writes and edits. So welcome, 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 Kathleen. I'm so glad you said yes. (laughs) I'm glad you invited me. (laughs) Yes. Kathleen and I met very briefly in a, I mean, I belong to a group of editors and we met very briefly and I was like, her, I want her on my show. So I just reached out to her and I was like, let's do it. And I'm so glad she said yes. So welcome, Kathleen. Thanks for joining us. Thank no you for having me. I, I love this show. I've been watching all the episodes and I'm just excited to be a part of <laughs> this uh, amazing and creation. Perfect. And I'm so happy <laughs> to have you here. Now, as I said earlier, you're an, I know you're an editor, but you've also got your podcast and you're also a writer. So we're going to mm-hmm. be digging into all the things. Before we start, before we dig into that, mm-hmm. I want to say that I really wanted to have this conversation because obviously there are a lot of writers who watch this and I, I want to bust out some myths about editing right Mm -hmm. we're going to be talking deep about editing and I feel like this is going to be perfect for anybody who is thinking about writing and and publishing anything yes right so we're going to bust down some editing myths today so tell me a bit about tell us a bit about your work uh as an editor tell us what type of editing you do and all the things well I edit the gamut of things everything from like um novels, short stories to um, 
social media copy, web copy. I edit everything. If it has words, I edit it. <laughs> mm. So um, I'm pretty new to the freelance aspect of it, although I've been editing for years, like a long time. I just finally decided like to make people pay me for it. <laughs> Same here. Same here. <laughs> like it's about time. <laughs> mm. I also do everything from like a simple proofreading to developmental edits, which are my favorite are developmental edits for sure. <laughs> yes, me too. And I, um, like you, like I remember during the pandemic is when I started actually doing the freelance editing and I was, I had done some edits for someone and a friend of mine was like, how long have you been editing? And I'm like, hmm, 20 years. She was like, what? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah editing I used to edit my friend's college Mm -hmm. (laughs) papers when I was at university I'm aging myself now but yeah I've been doing it for years and years and years listen Uh, I was editing in high school and writing people's papers in high school like my senior (laughs) year there were people who were like I don't want to write the senior paper can you do it for me and I was writing people's senior paper Mm -hmm. (laughs) craziness craziness so I know what you mean about having done it for so long. And then, you know, I've done a few courses and stuff like that, obviously. But like, mm-hmm. I, it, it, I've been doing it for so long. I think I almost took it for granted that yeah. it was something that, you know, you could actually charge people for. So it's been Definitely. great to kind of, you know, get stuck into freelancing. Like I said, I've taken some courses and just try to provide more, you know, more stuff to my clients. But you said your favorite is developmental editing. So mm-hmm. uh, we're going to dig into that before we do. I want to know why you think that Joyful Stories by Black writers and storytellers with Black characters, why is that important to you as a writer, as an editor, as a reader, as a person who has a podcast about (laughs) fiction? Like, (laughs) why why do you think that those joyful stories are important? I love that question because... I feel like we've been asking it a lot in just entertainment in general, where people are like, I'm sick of the slavery story. I'm sick of the white savior story. I'm sick of the black struggle story. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's important because it's hard to dream of yourself in a way or to envision a life that you've never seen. And so it's important for me to make sure that what I put out there is letting, you know, I'm born and raised in the Bronx. And so I want any other little girl growing up in the Bronx who feels a little weird to be able to see themselves in a story that I write that's joyful and know or imagine that I can have that kind of life too. I can see myself as a mythical creature or, you know, I can imagine myself as a superhero. I can think about myself in a way that, denotes you know joy and freedom and just positive experiences and growing up I never saw anything like that Mm -hmm. every image I saw of blackness especially black Americans was negative it was either we're the slave we're the thug we're the victim all the time and I know that as much pain as there was in my life there was an immense amount of joy and so I want to portray that in the work that I do so that anyone coming up behind me knows what is possible for them. Because I want everyone else to see or to envision themselves in places and in ways that we don't normally get to see in society. So, yeah, that's why it's important for me to have joy as a part of the stories I tell. I love that so much. And that, I, I agree with that. You know, everybody, most people that watch us know I'm based in the Caribbean. And it's the same, right? It's the same. Mm-hmm. You want You want to be able to provide a different story a different narrative Mm -hmm. around blackness and also for a young generation coming up like see something to have something to look forward to yes um so I absolutely love that is there a quote that you have brought to share with us today yes so let me make sure I got it right let me look at it real quick because I can I can say it right from the top yep right from the top of my head this is my favorite quote I have lived by this quote for practically all my life and I feel like I'm finally starting to really like put it into action and it's focused I'm a hustler and my hustle is trying to figure out the best ways to do what I like without having to do much else and that is Mm. by Yasin Bey also known as most deaf the rapper slash actor my favorite rapper in the world (laughs) and 
I love that quote because is that not what every artist is trying to do? Mm. Trying to figure out how to do the stuff that they like, create the things that they like without having to do anything else. And that's it. Right. I I love that. (laughs) And I think this is actually a perfect lead into talking about editing. My sister and I had a long conversation. We have long, I have two sisters, two wonderful sisters. Hey sisters, I know you're watching. I know you tell me you don't watch, but I know you're watching. I know you're looking. (laughs) I know you're looking. I know you check in. Um, And one of the things that one of the sisters I was talking to today and I were talking about is just in terms of writing, like so many writers tell me that they think they can write a book by themselves right Mm -hmm. um and they're afraid of the editing process because they feel like they're gonna get lost like their voice is gonna get lost they have this idea that the editor is gonna just come in and bulldoze in and remove them from their work and I Mm -hmm. you know as and I find this especially with um so I, I can speak about black writers but I can also speak about Caribbean writers very recently I was having a conversation with a local writer here and Mm -hmm. she had gone, she did her, her master's in, I think it was in creative writing, either in the UK or the US, I can't remember. And, you know, she was saying she wanted to write a book that had in a Caribbean dialect, right? Every, each island tends to have their own dialect, their own patois type of thing. And kind of being told like, you need to write in standard English, blah, blah, blah. Right. And so I, I get that. I think a lot of, you know, I know it happens for, for Caribbean writers if they're um, abroad or if their work is being, their work is being read or published abroad, having this concern that what the essence of it is going to be removed by the editor. And so they have a sphere of the editing process or they don't even think that an editor is necessary. They can do it themselves. They can get a friend to just read through it and, and that type of thing. So I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into that. Get two editors together, so you might get a bit nerdy, but um, I'm okay <laughs> with that. <laughs> Kathleen is okay. Be prepared for the nerds to jump get out. Get <laughs> ready, get ready. But I know, like I said, how do you describe the editing process to clients or to people who might ask, what what is it? The first thing I, I would say is editing is a suggestion. We mm. are paying, you're paying us to suggest things to you. Nothing we say is written in stone. You do not have to take any of our advice. If you feel like an editor is giving you a suggestion that does not feel true to your characters, that does not feel true to your story or to you and your voice as a writer, you can absolutely disregard it and move on to the next suggestion. It's your work. And I will say, though, that it's a valid fear because I've experienced working with people like that who felt like if you weren't writing like Shakespeare, then you were not valuable as a writer. Mm. And so I completely understand having that fear that someone is going to try to impose themselves onto your work. But like I said, it's all suggestions and you don't have to take anyone's ideas or thoughts about your work seriously. You don't. No. And I think that's so important. I had a really good when I, um, the, my first book, which I self-published, I had an a, amazing editor. And that was one of the first things that she told me. She was like, you don't have to change anything you don't want to change. Like, let's mm-hmm. start there. Right. Um, and how I tend to describe editing to my clients is like, editing is as you said it's a suggestion which you you know it's up to you whether you take it or leave it but it's really a way of having an external lens to kind of catch the things that you did not catch Mm -hmm. um to to help you like I had a a guest who by the time this comes out she would have been out last week Don Michelle Hardy she's a literary agent and different and she said editing makes you a better writer right absolutely because you already know the full story in your mind. And so you're, you're reading and you're filling in the gaps, whether it's, whether it's your spelling, whether it's the grammar that you're using, you spell something wrong, but in your mind, you're seeing it correctly because mm-hmm. you already know how to spell it. But it's also the stories. You know the background of the story. You, are, you know all these things. Maybe the reader doesn't know these things. And so sometimes the editor will come along and be like, you know, you can flesh this out more, right? Mm-hmm. I think people think an editor is going to take their work and rewrite it for them and be like, oh, right. okay, well, I've sent it off to the printers now, so too bad for you, when mm-hmm. really, an editing is a collaborative process. 
Yes. Right? It's a very collaborative process with between you, the writer, and the editor, with the editor making sure that the reader you, is reading your intention for the story, yes. um, which you may not have been clear about because you already know it in your head. And so you've been skipping pieces out and missing or whatever the case may be. So that's what the editors are for. They're there to collaborate with you as the writer. So they're not there to rewrite it for you or right. hold those over your opinions. It's like they're there to collaborate with you to ensure that what you present to the world was what you intended to present. Exactly. And so if it's your intention to present something that's written, um, there's a book that I love, uh, Love After Love by Ingrid Prasad. She's a Trinidadian um, writer. And we read it for our book club a few months ago, last year, I think. She's, I love her. She's actually come, I actually got to meet her in person at our, when we read her first book for our book club. And we talked about it then, right? She writes a lot of Trinidadian phrases and accent. And I, I actually had the audio book. So I felt like she was sitting in my kitchen reading it to me, which was so I love awesome. That. And that is it. That is the book that she wanted. That's the experience she wanted the reader to have. And to Mm -hmm. me, an editor is there to ensure that the reader has the experience that you want them to have. A good editor. Yes, a good editor. That's what they're there to do. Collaborate Mm -hmm. with you to do that. So that's how I tend to describe it. And I love how you describe it as a suggestion because it's really important to realize, like, you don't have anything you don't want to is your book. Right, right. right. And trust me, there are times when we might be telling you the right thing and you're like, I'm not with it. And that's fine. (laughs) It is your work at the end of the day. Yeah. And there may also be times where I need you to explain it to me better (laughs) so that I can do a better job of helping you bring that work into the world. Another way I like to think of editing is like, I know everyone's wearing their wireless headphones now and their earbuds and blah, blah, blah. But there was a time when we all had wired headphones connected to our device and then connected to our ears. And no matter how hard you tried to put that thing in your pocket neatly, by the time you pulled it out, it was a jumbled up mess. And to me, that's the writing process. No matter how neat and clear your story is in your head, Mm. by the time you get it to paper, it's all over the place. And you may be putting your best effort into making it organized. And the editing process is you taking the time to unravel, work out the knots, pull it apart and make it make sense. And you want an editor who can sit with you and really pull it apart neatly, calm you down when you're losing your control <laughs> to pull out the knots that maybe you're missing because you're a little too frazzled by the overall story and really help you to get it to the point where you've got that full linear chord that you can finally listen to your music or your podcast or whatever with that's the editing process and you want someone who's going to work with you hand in hand in that process and not try to take it over or try to make it seem like you don't know what you're doing and make you feel comfortable that's the editing process and I totally agree with that completely and I still have wired headphones so not even gonna lie yeah I it is what it is (laughs) Uh, this is a this is new. Last season, I had wired <laughs> headphones all the way, <laughs> so I feel you completely. Um, and I love that. I love that description of just untangling it and you know realizing that as a writer, sometimes you're too close to your own work to edit. Yes. It. Not that you can't edit it, but that having that outside lens can help you gain that little bit of perspective. Mm-hmm. And I think that's how an editor makes you a better writer because. They, they kind of can tease out the nuances. They can kind of say, like, talk about this more, like, you know, or they can say, like, you know, if you would have said this thing about this character in chapter one, we would have been rooting for him yes. in chapter 11 or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just remembering that sometimes you already know so much, you're so close to your work um, and you need somebody who has that sort of uh, different perspective yeah, to yeah. really kind of get into it. Um, and so how would you say you think editing impacts the a final product, whether it's a book? Because like, I know you edit different things, social media. I'm the same. I do blog posts. I do, mm-hmm. um, I tend to more do nonfiction. I don't really edit fiction so much. Um, oh, yeah. Right now I do a lot of nonfiction um, books, uh, blogs, that type of thing, social media not for any reason other than I feel like I only read certain types of fiction and I know that this is a whole, this is going to be a whole other conversation, but books have a, have a rhythm. They have a beat, right? 
And I feel mm-hmm. like I don't always know the rhythm and the beats for like, I wouldn't do science fiction because I don't read a lot of science fiction. I wouldn't do fantasy because I don't read a lot of fantasy. And so to me, I don't think I would do it justice to the writer I get it. without ha- knowing the rhythm and the cadence and the beat that a book would have. So mm-hmm. I don't, but I know you, you, you know, you've got <laughs> a lot of experience with those things. Um, so I'm curious, how do you think, uh, or how do you describe the impact that editing has on the finished product? So I feel like the real storytelling happens in the editing process. And so I feel like the the impact it has on the finished product is that the real story is going to be told after editing. You don't have the real story the first time you get it out on paper. You don't really have the full ga- the full understanding of your characters or the arc they're going to have. You don't really know that story until you've edited at least 10, 15, 2,000 times. <laughs> Once mm. you have gone oh, yeah. back and forth <laughs> with that work, whether it's with someone else or on your own, that's when you're like, okay, now I know who these characters mm. are. And I know for a fact that in chapter three, when she said that one line of dialogue, that was absolutely not her. And I need to change that. And yes. you wouldn't, you cannot know that until you have the editing process to mm. me. <laughs> I, and I totally agree with that. I even think like I always, uh, one uh, writer I do like, Neil Gaiman, and I remember mm. him saying that like, you know, he's, sometimes he's halfway through a book before he knows what the book is even about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right mm-hmm. and so don't believe that's why I tell people like don't write and edit yourself even there's some people who like they can't get past chapter one because they keep going over it and trying to get it perfect and I'm like you can't perfect chapter one until you've written chapter 12 yep so don't even try it. don't even go back just write forward mm-hmm. um and then that editing process will will even assist you even greater in in getting chapter one perfect now that you've gotten to chapter 12 and you actually understand what chapter one is really supposed to be right right Right. once you get to know your characters once you're at the end and then you figure out what your ending is and you're like yeah all that stuff that happened in chapter one no that's not really what's supposed to happen let me go back now that I've finished let me go back and make this the book it's really supposed to be (laughs) yeah and I absolutely love that so so much um choosing an editor so we've already talked a bit about the editing process and how collaborative it is um and maybe you know I know a lot of and this is no insult to people who you know how they ad- advertise their work but I always you know I'm in a groups of writers and sometimes people are like I want the editor and somebody's like oh just go find somebody on whatever website I won't give the name away um and it's kind of like more of a focus on pr- cost right. but I feel like there's so many other things to consider when you want to choose an editor um, what are a few that you think would be really helpful for any of the writers watching? One thing I want to say is as a writer myself, it is 100% okay for you to vet an editor. Take your time, ask them questions, find out what types of books they like to read, what types of things have they edited in the past, what are their feelings on, you know, dialects and in dialogue and know those things before you give them your work because you want to make sure that you have someone who's editing your work that not necessarily sees the world the way that you do but respects the way that you see the world and understands that you're putting bits of yourself into your work and so there are things that they just cannot fully critique or understand because it's something coming from you so you want to make sure that you're taking the time to say, you know, what do you read? I, I'm writing a, a literary fiction book about, you know, two kids who save the world, but those kids are from the inner city or, you know, they're from a specific type of culture. And are you OK with editing that work? Do you mm-hmm. understand the nuances of that culture? And if you don't, do, will you take the time to have conversations with me? about those nuances before making final decisions about what you think should be changed and what shouldn't. Those yeah. are the things that I would suggest greatly. Yeah. And I love that so much. That brings us to something that, you know, I, you may d- dive into a bit deeper later on, but I think that understanding, you know, when I talked earlier about the fact that books have a, they have a beat, they have a cadence, they have a rhythm. I have, there's a a friend of mine who's in my book club and she did this challenge where she was reading books from all over the world. And one of the things I remember her saying is like books from different cultures, they carry a different 
blueprint for lack of a better word. Like, you know, if you read a love story that's from a Western country, it's like girl meets boy, girls. Like, you know, if you watch a Hallmark movie, you know what I'm talking about. Like girl mm-hmm. meets boy, mm-hmm. you know, just had a breakup, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, whatever the case may be. That She's they have, looking to make you know, a change in her life. To make a change in her life. Her path. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, it's act two. There's a misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. And, and the reality of it is when people are reading the, those books, sometimes they're actually, they are actually looking for those, those kind of like hallmarks, right? They're looking for right. those sort of that not beat. They know, you know, it's like a superhero movie. You know, that there's going to be a secondary character who's probably going to betray, it. you know, they're going to start mm-hmm. off good and then they're going to be bad. They're going to start off bad. Mm-hmm. Like there are all these mm-hmm. different markers that are sort of, they make it feel familiar, right? Yes. Uh, if you go and read a book from a different culture, sometimes part of the reason it feels so weird is because it doesn't follow that structure. It doesn't follow that sort of cadence. It doesn't have that rhythm. And so if you're going to, if you, especially for somebody who is from a different culture and you are writing a book that you want it to feel familiar based on the type of books that are coming out of your culture, you want an editor to understand that and not to say, well, this has to be here and that has to be there because they're coming at it with the lens of, you know, from this right. particular culture. Right. And so I think that's really important for them. As you said, like, if you're not aware, are you willing to listen to me and yes. understand that this is, this is a structure that I want it to have because there's no, there's no right way to write a book right? mm-hmm. and understanding that. Um, and so I think that's really good for me. One of the things that, I think is important when you're choosing an editor, uh, one of the important questions to ask yourself and to understand about yourself is how do you like to receive feedback? What sort of feed, how do you like to receive it? How do you like to sort of what that level of communication and make sure that you and the editor are on the same page? Because I think, and this is something um, I was doing a bit of reading, watching some stuff on from informed editing, but basically they talking about you know, if somebody's writing something really personal to them, you're writing a memoir or you're writing a, mm-hmm. a your personal story or the book, you know, a lot of a lot of us writers, we want to write this book since we were a child. OK, it's like our, mm-hmm. you know, as one of the, one of my guests, he's he's not. Yeah, I recorded him ready, but he'll be after this when he says, like, it's your baby. You know, you don't want anybody to tell you that your baby's ugly. Like that's <laughs> basically what it is. It's right? like this is your your something that's so personal to you. And you want the person to be able to respect that and kind of communicate you with you in a way that you can work with them, right? And so to me, it's learning how to kind of set up your own boundaries beforehand and see, can I actually communicate with this person? Are they the kind of person that I can talk to? But if I feel uncomfortable with something, I can tell them. Like, I feel like, and that, that's part of the reason why, like, I try to talk to my clients before they hire me, even though I know everybody's like, I don't have time for that. Well, yeah, because mm-hmm. especially for something personal, like they, I want them to feel like, can you talk to me? Can you say to me, well, what about mm-hmm. this? What about that? And I don't like the suggestion that you made. And, you know, how comfortable do you feel advocating for yourself? Because you're going to have to do that, or you may have to do that during the process. And you want to make sure it's somebody that you can do that with. Yes. Yes. I think that's amazing. And I'm going to be honest, I never think to mention that because I try to move within the editing experience because as a writer, I am not sensitive at all. I want you to tell me my baby is ugly so that I don't go around showing everybody my baby. (laughs) Tell me my baby is ugly. (laughs) Please. Please. Oh my life. I embarrass myself showing my baby off on Instagram and, and you're like, everyone's no, like, no. you need a hat on that chick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Put a you veil over truth. that face, something. <laughs> you want the truth. Exactly. And my feelings will not get hurt. They never get hurt. But I have had the experience where I wrote a short story about my experience with my father, who was an immigrant from Jamaica. And I wrote about my experience with him as my father and he's passed away now, God rest his soul. But I wrote about that experience and how our relationship kind of developed after his death, as well as what it was before his death. And I handed it to someone to write, to edit who has had a very traumatic experience with their own father. 
And she could not objectively edit that work because in her mind, there was no redeeming my father for any of his flaws or his mistakes because she could not redeem her own father. And she just could not see my work the way that I had written it from my experience. She could only see it through her own experience, which is fair. And Mm. I feel like that may have been my mistake in giving her that work because I knew that about her past. And so I should have known better than to give her that work. And she wasn't an editor. She was a writer friend that I just said, hey, take a look. And Mm -hmm. listen, this is why you need a real editor. Why you need a real (laughs) editor, objective person. Yeah. And and also somebody who would say, I can't edit this. Yes. Right. Somebody who's professional enough to say, yeah, no, I'm not editing this. And there's some things that I will not edit. Same. Absolutely. There's some things I'm just not, I know that I can't handle it. It's not for me. My emotional state (laughs) will be impacted greatly. And so I'll let you pass that on to someone else who can do a better job. Who will do it justice, who will will really do a service to your story. Yes. So that's such a, a good example to give. I just wanted to let you know how you can support us over here at Writing Black Joy. Firstly, you can join our Patreon community over at patreon.com slash Sophia Robinson, and you'll find the link for that in the show notes. When you sign up over at Patreon to support us, you will get the opportunity to join our monthly group coaching calls and workshops that we'll be holding exclusively for Patreon supporters. So come on over and join the party. It's so much fun over there. Other ways you can support us, hit subscribe here on your podcast or over on the YouTube channel. You can also leave a podcast review, like our YouTube episodes, and share us with your friends. You can head over to our website and sign up for our mailing list, www.writingblackjoy.com. Also, follow Writing Black Joy over on Instagram at Writing Black Joy. All of these will be in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening and for supporting our show. What are your thoughts? This is a bit random, but this is based on a conversation that I was having with some other, other editors, the same group that we were part of before, like before you joined it. We were talking a bit about how language has changed over time. And this is something, mm-hmm. I don't know, I don't know how much you know about Enid Blyton because you, you know, I know that's more of a British thing, but I grew up reading <laughs> Enid Blyton books, right? I grew up as a child reading Enid Blyton books. Love them then, still love them now. But it's very clear that they were written in the 1940s mm-hmm. <laughs> by a very privileged white person in a time when this was the dynamic, right? And so the, a lot of the things that she has written about and talks about and the way she talks about them, the language that she uses would probably not be appropriate now at all. Right. right? Like that's just the way it is. And language is changing all the time, right? I think it uh, our sort of the nuance, our understanding of it is changing all the time. How do you communicate to writers, you know, if they've written something that you think to yourself, well, that would probably be offensive right now. If you see what I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but like, how, like, how do you tend to handle that? I'm just curious. I come right out and say it. I mean, I'm, I'm gentle about it. There's, um, I don't know if you know the Hillary Duff song with love where in the song, she's just like, say what you need to say to me, judge me and criticize me, but say it with love because you know, remember that you love me. Mm. <laughs> so I will do it with love. If I know you and I know that your intention is not to be disrespectful or insensitive or racist or, or sexist or any type of phobic or ism, if I know you. And I know that you don't intend that I have no problem saying, Hey, so this wording right here, it can imply this thing. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's your intention. Maybe look into changing that or do a little bit more research behind what that really means, that phrase Mm -hmm. really means. And I've done that before. And the person was like, oh my God, thank you. I didn't even realize I I did the research and I I saw what it means and I completely took it out of everything that I write. I will never use it again. But you will have someone who's like, well, I don't see what the big deal is. Mm-hmm. And if that's the way you feel, I'm not the editor for you. That's that's what I was going to say. And I know, you know, something I, I, I would have read it in the bio and, you know, something would have been mentioned off the air. But I know you in your in your bio, you said that your sort of experience, both as a black woman, as somebody with a disability, it kind of 
it, it shows itself up in your editing. So mm -hmm. then how do you find, because I know, you know, something that I'm more aware of now is even very ableist language and yes. things that are concepts, ideas that are very ableist. And I think that's, that's even, it's not a new concept, but I think it's something that a lot of people may not be familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so again, um, what, you know, I'd love to hear your, your take on that a little bit as that's your experience and you're sort of more familiar with that. Yes. So I have lived my entire life with depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, sickle cell trait that I, the, the great gift that my father gave me, mm -hmm. <laughs> sickle cell trait. And so I understand what it's like to read something. And, and especially when I see someone who's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm, she's so neat. She's so OCD. And I'm like, yeah, that's not okay. Mm. That's ableist language. <laughs> yeah. And I have no problem saying that is ableist language because being OCD is not just wanting your room to be clean. Mm. <laughs> That's not yes. what OCD is. <laughs> um, or someone who's just like, oh, I can't focus today. It's my ADD. And it's first of all, ADD is not a phrase that is used anymore. It's ADHD. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that is the blanket term. And it is a spectrum. And you just not being able to focus today because you're having a bad day is not that. And I feel like being able to not just, you don't have to have the experience of it to speak on it. If you see it and if it makes you feel uncomfortable at all, at all, or you, you do a bit of research to say, is that really, I, I don't feel like that's the phrasing that's used anymore. Let me look it up. Let me Google it. Let me read a little bit and get back to this writer and say, you know, so I did some research and I don't think that's the way people are describing this issue anymore I don't think this language that you're using around it is appropriate anymore you might want to look into changing that but then we also have to realize that there are times when if certain language is being used by a character it may be because that character is the sort of person that would use that language that, that language yes and so you have to recognize that and you have to understand that it is not, I've had to deal with people who were trying to correct characters. And I'm like, the writer knows that that is not okay. The point mm. is, is this is a character that's an asshole <laughs> and we're not supposed right. to like them. <laughs> yes. I'm mean, supposed to hate them for saying these things. And so yeah. there's a nuance to it for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I, um, I always remember, you know, there's, there are times when, and I remember there was a there's a book that I've been reading recently. The uh, writer is a black writer, and he had a white ghostwriter. And you know, he was talking about an experience that he had growing up. All of the names that he was being called, N word, this, that, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know, the 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 ghostwriter was like, "Can you can I use this language?" And I'm like, "But he's relaying a personal experience." Yes, right. I might edit that differently to how I might edit, you know, somebody who's just using it for the sake of, I, I, don't, know, right. I don't know how else to describe it, but like, this is your, you have to be respectful of the fact that this was his personal experience. He's mm -hmm. writing a personal story. He's relaying an actual experience that he had versus, you know, saying, well, we can't use this language anymore now because blah, 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 whatever. So to me, it's, it is just being able to understand that nuance, but I think that's why you need an editor that you can really advocate for yourself with. And you have yes. to be prepared to advocate for yourself as a writer, regardless, because there are going to be times when you need to stand up for you, for what you've written, for your story, for your character, for whatever the case may be. And yeah. so to me, I think that's really important as well. Um, I'm curious, what type of obstacles do you, have you seen your clients face or maybe fellow writers face as they have tried to go through the editing process or even the publishing process? The publishing process is hard to say because I, unfortunately, I'm not, well, publishing in the sense of like short stories and publications, mm -hmm. but I don't, yeah. I'm not yet a, amongst the elite who have published novels Whatever. and like all of that stuff. <laughs> It's not, it's not even that exciting. It's not even that, but I, yeah. yeah. So I can say that um, for me personally, an issue that I've had with having my work edited was mm -hmm. people not imposing their expectations of my culture or my upbringing on my writing. Because yes, I was born and raised in the Bronx, New York. And anyone who knows the Bronx, New York knows it's the hood. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. And <laughs> but there are some beautiful parts of the Bronx. And I grew up walking distance from a beach and people are just like, oh, this isn't the real Bronx, right? This is some type of like <laughs> Neo. And I'm like, no, this is no, this please. in this story is the Bronx. <laughs> I don't know what you think the Bronx and it's people who've never been there who just have this preconceived notion of what it is to be from the Bronx and who hear me speak or see what I'm writing. And like, this is not what I would expect from a person from the Bronx. And it's like, what do you, who do you think lives in the Bronx? A bunch of eight people. I don't know what you Mm. think is happening. (laughs) No, but I think like, to me, that, that gets to the heart of even, you know, why I kind of did this series, but like why I think, I, I call them, I always talk about everyday storytellers and mm-hmm. I talk about the fact that you, you want people to tell the, tell their stories and tell them their story. You don't have to write a book to tell your story. You don't no. have to have a short story published in a, liter- a journal to, ha- to tell your story. You don't have to have a blog to tell your story mm-hmm. or be in a theater or whatever the case may be, have a podcast, whatever the case is. To me, that's why I call them everyday storytellers. I'm like, these stories need to be out there because the reality of it is I think that stories real stories can smash a lot of stigmas and stereotypes. Yes. Right. And that is, that is what is so critical about having these different stories out there. You know, again, talking to my sister this morning, I was saying, you know, a lot of, a lot of what is out there is out there because that's what was always out there. So before there was a lot of self publishing and a lot of the internet allowed people to have their blogs and Wattpad and, medium and vocal and all the different platforms that you can kind of share your writing on and and you can share your writing in so many ways you don't have to have a blog go and get a medium account go and join sign up for vocal or whatever the case is but Mm -hmm. that's a separate point before there were all of these things and there were so many more gatekeepers it's kind of like people always published what they always publish and so you just get these um reinforcement of these stereotypes and these stigmas Mm -hmm. of like People from the Caribbean, they're like this. People from the Bronx, they're like that. People from wherever. And um, one of the examples that, she, you know, she and I were talking about, one of my future guests, so you're going to be hearing from him in a couple of weeks' time, Philip Robinson, also, yes, relation. <laughs> and um, <laughs> oh, nice. he wrote a book called Nia and the Kingdom of Celebration. That was his first children's book. And he want, he wrote it for his daughter because he wanted to write a daughter about um, a royal family that was like dark skin, black, mm-hmm. so that she could see herself reflected in this book. He lives in the UK. Um, his, his family, they're all in the UK now, but he grew up in Barbados with us. And, you know, he said that when he, he was working with this, um, this illustrator, and when she first returned the, the pictures back to him, he was like, they don't look royal, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to spoil the story for people who are listening, but you got to listen to that episode. It's so, 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 so good. Yeah. But, you know, my sister and I were talking this morning about um, if you asked a, a, ch- a black child from the Caribbean to draw a princess, they're probably going to draw this blonde haired, blue eyed, because mm-hmm. that's their idea of what it is. And, and I'm like, right, but that's why you need these stories out there to smash those stereotypes, to show different ideas to kind of okay yeah you can have an Indian princess or you can have a black princess or you can have a mixed race princess whatever the mm-hmm, case be, mm-hmm. right um and have those stories out there so I think like you know your your sort of stories about the Bronx and the beautiful parts of it like that's why you need to tell those stories so that people can who haven't Definitely. been to the Bronx or who might not go to the Bronx because they feel like oh I don't want to go down there because it's going to be all crazy like mm-hmm. Oh, is there a nice side to it? I didn't, I didn't realize. Yeah, let me go and, and visit. Mm-hmm. I always say when I, the very first time I visited New York, and this was not the Bronx, this was just New York. Um, I grew up in Barbados. I was living in England at the time. My best friend was studying in New Jersey, but she was living in an apartment in New York. Um, and so I'm visiting for the first time. And all I remember is hearing all these people talking about, you go on the subway, you're going to get shot. All this. Oh stuff. my right? and God. Like, uh, okay, sure. <laughs> So uh, I get the plane over, I get this thing, and she's like, you're going to get the shuttle from, let me see if I can get this right. You're going to get the shuttle from Times Square Mm -hmm. to Grand Central, right? 
That's that's right. They're kind of the, they're kind of the same, just different ends of the same. Right. So there's a shuttle that will take you from one to the next, right? Yeah. yeah. And I didn't I didn't understand that that was all the shuttle did, right? Yes. <laughs> so I guess it takes you from one end of forty seconds to the other, <laughs> other end. Exactly. That's literally all it does. Literally. <laughs> Get into the subway now, and. It, it, maybe it's at Times Square, it stops at Grand Central. And I know I'm like, do I get out here? Like, what's happening? And I didn't want to ask any questions because I'm like, I'm sure if I ask, what, like, you know, that somebody's going to think, oh, she's a tourist. And then I'm going to, you know, somebody's going to kidnap me uh, watching too much Law and Order or whatever, right? Um, listen, I went back and forth between Times Square and Grand Central about six times before I got off the subway. <laughs> and I kept getting out of one door and going into the next. Because I didn't want to ask. I was so afraid. My friend was like, what is wrong with you? But it, honestly, because I didn't want to ask any questions. And I would, I'd always heard these things. about like, you get on the New York subway. Like, someone's going to, you know, like, you're not going to make it out oh alive. Type of there thing. is nothing a New Yorker loves more than being asked directions. They love putting on display how well they know the city. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, like, that's not what they don't tell you that on the news. <laughs> so I just love, I love it that they're, you know, that we have so many resources now for telling these stories and like people getting to know your hometown in a, right. in a way that they could, wouldn't otherwise do it if all that was out there were like stereotypes and stigmas. So I think that's mm-hmm. just a perfect example. And we just went on a complete tangent, but we're going <laughs> to bring it right back uh, to uh, my sort of semi last question about editing before we dive into a little bit talking about your writing mm-hmm. what advice would you give a writer a writer who's looking for an editor or just in general like in general a writer who may be looking for an editor who may be afraid of the editing process who may be like yeah I don't want an editor I don't need an editor that's too much money or whatever the case may be what advice would you give an ed- a writer who's curious about the editing process I would say, number one, I know that we put, as a writer, we put ourselves completely into our stories. We pour ourselves into it. But there is a point where you have to let the story go and put it into the world and put it into someone's hands and understand that someone's critique or edits of your work is not personal. It is not about you as a person and it is not about your skills as a writer. And the goal is always to make it the best it can be. Don't take it to heart. And I know that it's easier said than done, but I'm telling you that has been the best thing that has happened to me as a writer is to know that, oh, you don't like that story? All right. (laughs) That's all right. That's cool. It's okay. It's fine. Moving on. There are billions, literally billions of people on this earth at least one of them is going to like your work. <laughs> yes. And at the end of the day, you don't like everything you read. Exactly. Everybody's not going to like your story. Exactly. That doesn't so you can't expect anyone anything. to like what you write if you don't like everything that you experience. No, never. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is just the way it is. You're not going to like yeah, everything. Okay. Everybody's not going to like everything. It's just how mm-hmm. it is. Um, one thing that we didn't do, but we can kind of like do quickly, because as I said, right at the beginning, you said you really loved about developmental editing. And mm-hmm. I feel like I want to, I, I, I can start and then you can jump in if you want. But like, I just wanted writers to know that there are different types of editing. Mm-hmm. All right. So I always describe developmental editing. Like to me, that's, that's a real cool creative process of like, you may have a bunch of content. Maybe you've got blog posts, maybe you've got like, bits of a story from here or there you've got ideas you've got things in your journal that you've been writing down like you've got a fair amount of content and the developmental editor works with you to kind of bring the story together bring the draft together um Mm -hmm. what, what would you add to that if you're having like bits and pieces here or there I think that's when you really need to get a second person involved. That's when you really need to get an editor involved because when you have all of these pieces and you're not seeing the way to connect it all, it's, you are looking at it too much and you may need, you may need to zoom out and let someone else deal with it. I mean, if I can inject my own experience into here, because I've been doing that the entire time. That's why why you're here. (laughs) That is why you're here. And I'm not here on my own. So go for it. (laughs) So I, I recently completed my MFA, I think December 2020, I graduated. Mm-hmm. And 
the last semester of that, I had to edit over 75,000 word, 150 page thesis. And there is a point where you get to where you just cannot look at your own work anymore. My thesis mentor at one point asked, so do you want to run through one more edit? How do you feel about it? I, and I was just like, I cannot read these words anymore. <laughs> I cannot do it. I need to move on to a different part of this process already. And after I submitted it and I came back to it six months later, I was reading it like, I wish I had changed this. I wish this word had been this word. I wish the dialogue was a little bit more like this, but that was because I pulled away from it and other people had a chance to look at it and tell me what they thought and give me some ideas for improvements. And that's the process you need to have. So when you have a piece here and a piece there and you're not really sure how to connect it and you might think that this way and the characters look in this way in this section and then they change to this in this section, you're not sure how you got from A to B. You need someone else's opinion mm. to get in there and show you, well, this is how you got from A to B. This is yes. what you're missing. And to tease it out of you, to pull it out of you. Sometimes yes. you need somebody to ask you those questions to kind of te- like in a different way to how you're asking them to yourself to kind of tease those details out and ask questions. Of, Ooh, good question. I never thought about that, but that's actually right. perfect. Like you need that, that person to kind of pull it out of you sometimes. And yes. to me, that's what developmental editing is yes and I love that moment when someone's like did you think about this with that character and I'm like oh duh perfect (laughs) I love it exactly what I needed thank you so that that's developmental editing Uh, and so that's something that you would do before you're even finished the piece right oh yeah um so then you have and I I realize different people different sphere they call it different things they may call it copy editing there's line editing that Mm -hmm. type of thing and I feel like so that is to me now that's with a finished draft right so you've finished Mm -hmm. your draft you've kind of gone through a few edits yourself um, and now you're giving it to someone else to kind of do the, the first broad edit and to me copy copy editing um structural editing whatever you want to call it it's like the person looking at the book and ensuring you have coherence, cohesiveness, continuity yes. from one chapter to the next, from one from the beginning to the end. The example that I always give you writing nonfiction is like you might decide I'm going to write this book for for um, moms. I, I'm going to write a book for moms and I'm writing all this stuff for mom. And then by the end of it, you're talking about pregnancy. And it's like, did you mean to do that? Did you, did you want, did you mean to be switching kind of like who the focus was on? Maybe you want to switch these around so that you start talking about pregnancy and then you end up talking about moms. Maybe you don't want to include this piece. Maybe you just want to yes. keep the mom bit here and take the pregnancy, you know, like how make sure that the book is cohesive and coherent mm-hmm. and the content, you don't switch context from beginning to end, that type of thing. Yes. Right. So that to me is more like that structural piece. So the, you've got a finished draft now. Um, and the person is just helping you to ensure that the reader has this great experience of reading from start to finish. And they, you, it kind of is what you want it to be. Right. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I think that's a perfect way to describe it. It's definitely making sure, you know, if you started out writing in past tense in the beginning, mm-hmm. you didn't suddenly become present tense in the middle and then go mm-hmm. back to being past tense. And yeah. you want someone else to look at that and see yeah. that. And that's really what, you know, line editing and copy editing can do is they really take their time and they're going through each and everything that you say and making sure that what you're saying makes sense and yes. connects to what you intend to say. And it, and it is what you intend to say. And I always say like, you know, I, I've been blogging for a few years now and I started um, recording, audio recording my blogs and even reading them out loud, I was catching my own mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, that's to me, like an editor can do that on a larger scale because it's hard for you to catch your own mistakes. And so they're looking at that's you know, it's called line editing because they go line by line. Like, did this sentence yes. make sense? Like the paragraph might have made sense, but this sentence, this doesn't actually make sense. Like it doesn't actually fit here. It doesn't yes. make any sense. Is that what you meant to say? Did it, was this a typo? Did you miss out a word? Like 
this mm-hmm. doesn't actually make sense. And when you read it, because you know what it's supposed to say, you just glossed right over it. You don't even right. know that it's there. So that's what the line editing to me process is about. Yeah. And not just that. It's just like in this conversation, how many times have we gone off on a tangent? You do mm. that in your writing. Oh, and yeah. you want someone to catch those tangents and say, hey, you got a little personal right here. Yeah. I think that was back. supposed to happen right there. Bring <laughs> it back. Take that out. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> or, or vice versa. One of my guests from season one, Maria Calmore, um, she talked about when she had written a book for entrepreneurs and the editor was like, you know, maybe use some personal stories, personal examples here. And she was like, nobody wants to hear my personal story. I'm like, uh, yeah, they do. No, we need it there. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so even to, to kind of make those types of suggestions to bring in, you know, that type of thing and how can you bring it in to, to, to give an example without kind of going off point. Yeah. Right. So to me, that's what the line editing, the copy editing, because there's lots of different ways to describe it, but that's what that process Mm -hmm. is. Um, And then, you know, finally we talk about proofreading, which is, I think the thing that everybody thinks about the typos and the grammar and the, you know, that type of thing. Um, And that's a different thing. Again, that is Mm -hmm. there are, proofreaders aren't supposed to make structural corrections they're not supposed to say right. put this here and put that there they're really there to just they really should be dealing with a finish in fact I remember learning um a while ago that it's it's it should actually it's, it came from the newspaper like the media uh, newsprint era where the person was proofing the layout and so they're like your book should actually if it's a book it should actually be laid out when you're proofreading it so that mm-hmm. you can make sure that you know, you don't end up with sentences like half a word, <laughs> like, to, you know, like <laughs> that type of thing. So even little things like that, the mm-hmm. proofreader can catch. Um, and so that's why <clears throat> sometimes you will, you will write a book, the person will proofread the, the, the thing on the computer, then you'll go and have it laid out in the book, and then you'll get the book draft back. And you're like, this, it's a totally this different experience. Thing. It's like a totally yeah. different book. Yes. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's, it's important to have proofreading done at the right time. Don't expect when you give, when you come to work with your developmental editor, they're not checking spelling typos. That's right. It's not going to happen. Right. When you, That's even right. when you have your copy editor, they might not, and they send something back to you to make changes to, they're not necessarily going to be correcting typos. That's not what happens then. That has to be the last thing that happens because if you're making changes then you want the, the typos corrected after you've made the changes, after you've got it laid out, after you have it, however you want it. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's what I would say. Have you got anything you'd like to say about copy? Because I know you do some um, proofreading as well. Oh, yeah. With proofreading, um, it is definitely something that should happen when you're already at the point where I'm ready to start submitting this. I'm ready to start. And I just want to really get this as clean as possible because the de- developmental part of it, I don't care how you spell your words. I want to make sure you are telling the story. That's what the developmental part is. And then the copy and the line editing is making sure that it's coherent. And like you said, it's cohesive and it's neat. And then you get to the proofreading. It's like, we want to prove to people that you can read, (laughs) that you know how words should be spelled and where punctuation goes. And that is it. And if I'm completely honest, I hate proofreading. I don't do it. I hate it. (laughs) I won't, I won't. And that's something that I will, you know, like I, I will hire that out. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely hate it because I'm like, as a writer, I don't care. I do not care if my punctuation is okay. I do not. Did my character make sense to you? Did they come off the page the way I want them to? Great. I didn't spell that word right. I don't care. <laughs> it is what it is. You know? Like, yeah. And so that is, that is a thing, but um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I just thought it would be great. We, maybe we should, you know, if we had a proper editor listening to this episode, now they would have said, you should have said that at the beginning. But it's too <laughs> late now. I'm too editing late. this. And I promise you, I'm not moving it to the beginning. So if you've made it to this far in the conversation, congratulations. Now you know the difference of editing. <laughs> but uh, we Listen, probably should it's have in there. Up it's in there. Beginning, in middle, here. end. It's, it's in there. It's in here. So <laughs> let's switch topics slightly. I'd love to know a bit about your writing. So I know you write speculative fiction. Mm-hmm. So maybe there's some of us out there who don't know what that is. So can you like kind of like give us some examples or talk oh. a little bit about what, what type of thing you write? Absolutely. I love talking about speculative everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so speculative fiction is generally um, horror 
sci-fi, fantasy, and all of the subgenres in between and all of the ways you can mix those genres up together. And I absolutely love everything speculative. <laughs> How did you get into writing it? Was it something that you always used to read? Or, I mean, I guess maybe you still read it now. Like, how did you get into that? Yeah, I always read speculative fiction growing up. My favorite writer as a kid was R.L. Stein. I loved Goosebumps. You give me Goosebumps and you have made my day. One of my favorite books as a kid was called Home for the Holidays. Howl as in Ooh, a, howl. A wolf howling. And I just have always loved it. I love horror movies and fantasy and sci-fi is like my favorite subject all around. Um, but writing it, I never used to do. I always felt like, and this is probably going to sound ridiculous, but I thought that as a Black woman writing, I was only allowed to write like Toni Morrison or Zora Neale Hurston. And Mm -hmm. I didn't think that I had permission or the right to write characters that were anything other than a struggling Black woman. And it wasn't Mm -hmm. until an undergrad when I took a class where we would read a book and watch a movie and compare the themes and the way the stories were told in the two. And that professor gave me the um, Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. And that book blew my mind. It was like, oh, wait, I can write a book about like a Black girl who starts her own society and religion in a post-apocalyptic world. I can do that. I can write books about vampires that are black girls. Okay, wait a minute. What is this? Hold up. (laughs) Wait a damn minute here. What's Mm. going on? And that completely, from that point on, I have not written anything other than speculative because it, it completely changed my life. I wish, I wish someone in middle school had handed me an Octavia Butler book because I don't even know who I'd be at this point if I had had that information just a little bit sooner. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that so much. And I think I love that permission given. Yeah. Like we forget how, you know, doing something different gives other people that permission. Yes. To do it as well. And I'm so happy that you had a professor that was able to introduce you to that. We have a, there's a lady, uh, Barbadian lady, Karen Lord, and she writes um, sci-fi as well. Uh, she used to teach my sister at school, <laughs> like, you know, it's so random. Um, and I met her again, she came to our book club. Um, and it's been so nice. It was so nice meeting her, as you said, and feeling like, oh, like, I can write sci-fi. It's mm-hmm. not just for old white guys or whatever. Exactly. Like, you can write whatever you want. I, <laughs> I might need to, I might need to hire you as my developmental editor because I started writing this <laughs> Um, superhero book last year and it, it's kicking my butt right now okay yes so what, we're gonna talk about that <laughs> off air but let me tell you I, it's hurting it's hurting but I just wanted to I'm like oh what if I wrote about superheroes who are women in their 40s right I won't I won't even give it away but it's the ideas just appeal to me so much um I can't I please can't. please yeah. please even if you don't want me to edit it just please let me read it <laughs> I yeah. want this story to exist, please. So finish uh, it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you all about it when we get off the air. But it, I, I want to finish it so bad. But I'm in my own head because I think a part of the problem is, you know, when you grew up reading something like you talked about growing up reading Goosebumps and and like reading that type of thing. And I think sometimes you kind of you get in your own head, like you mm-hmm. kind of too perfectionistic about it, right? Like mm-hmm. you know, I always wanted to write this epic fantasy yeah and it, had to, and it couldn't just be a fantasy right it had to be epic yes you know, what I'm saying. it has to be it like world to, changing you know like it has to have it, <laughs> I always used to describe it as it has to have its own book to describe what's going on like you can't just oh, read yeah. like books you need to read the um the you accompanying need to read book the outline you need to yes. read you need the... to read this 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 um the word isn't even coming to me right now. So I feel really the really, index, really, the index, of all right? the words. Yes. Here's a special map. Here's a special of map of the world. <laughs> I develop all these things, and you know, and I can sit down and and knock out like a romance novel in no time because I don't really care. <laughs> when it comes to writing the thing that I always wanted to write, like I get in my head about it, and um, yeah. So I'm just just confessions of right here. Here, like it's not always. <laughs> 
just because you write one book doesn't mean that you can write every oh, yeah. book, every book that you start. But oh yeah. And not everyone's out here being Stephen King and writing a book every month. Nobody's, <laughs> we're no all struggling to get these books out of us. I know, right? <laughs> I, I keep on going. He, this is my permission slip to anybody out there. Like, just keep writing. It'll happen. It'll definitely yes. happen. Um, so what's been your proudest moment? Either as an editor, as a writer, as a whatever. Like, what's been, as a podcaster, we didn't even talk about your, we're going to have to be, <laughs> I think I'm going to have to have you back. And I've said this to every single guest. I'm like, I think I'm going to have to have you back. <laughs> we haven't even talked about that. But um, before we talk about that, tell me what has been your proudest moment as a, as a writer or an editor. This is hard to answer because for me, every moment is equally like a big deal. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I wrote for an hour today is as big a deal to me as oh, I got that short story published somewhere. Like they're equally great to me because I understand how hard it is just to write, (laughs) just to get the words on the page. It's hard. And so it's hard for me to say like what my proudest moment is. I think for me, the proudest moments are when I just do the thing and I stop thinking so much about it and mulling over it and being worried about it. And so creating my podcast when I spent years thinking about the podcast (laughs) finally just like having a single episode up was like oh my god it's not in here in my head anymore it's real and it exists in the world and so that those are the proudest moments when I actually do the thing (laughs) I'm so happy you don't even know how happy it made me that you said that because it is the truth. It is so the truth. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, the minute that you do that thing, you should be proud of yourself. And I think sometimes we gloss over those moments because, you know, because I wanted my first book to be this epic fiction and it wasn't, (laughs) it was this little nonfiction book about, you know, my own personal development journey. (laughs) Kind of glossed over that because it wasn't the thing. But, yeah, you know, it's a big deal. A big right. Deal. Like, even when you just write people, some people don't even get to the point of having a finished product that they can be disappointed in because they never finish. They never have the product. And so even if you don't love what you created, you created it when Maybe. so many people don't even get to that point. And so just that it's out there. It's like, I, I can't it. believe I did that. I love it. I love it. I love it. And tell us about your podcast because I need to, I'm going to be binge listening this as soon as I get off this call, right? So tell us about your podcast. So it's called Loud in the Theater and it's my brother and I talking about all things speculative in TV and movies. And sometimes you drop in bits and pieces of video games and podcasts because we're big giant nerds. And so we talk all about that stuff. I love it. I, I love that it. it's so exciting to be a nerd now. Oh, <laughs> yes, up, it, it was terrible great. being a nerd. Now I'm like, being a nerd. Is we are having best. our moments in oh, the world. We are. We're having our glow up. We need to just yes. go with it. <laughs> I'm going to luxuriate in it for as mm. long as I can before Me people too. are like, ew, nerds. I'm going to love on it. <laughs> I'm just loving it, loving up in it until, as you said, the next yes. thing comes along. Yes. So yeah, we just talk about and we're very like casual. And listen, if you don't like cursing, it is potty mouth central. We are saying the N-word. We're saying F you to each other. We curse each other out. <laughs> I curse my brother out all the time because he's always screwing something up. It's your <laughs> so brother. Like, what else are you gonna do with your brother? I mean, I don't have any brothers, but you know, I can listen. Imagine. If you cannot curse your sibling out, who can you curse out? What what do you even What's the point of life? siblings? Right. The whole reason they exist is so that you can do to them what you can't do to anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nyla and Tuliba, ignore what she just said, okay? We love each other, all right? Uh, uh, go ahead. Me too, but listen. <laughs> I love my siblings, but listen, I'm going to get the curse outs out of me <laughs> through them. <laughs> Yeah, we have a good time and we tell jokes and make fun of the stuff that we watch. And we're very, very brutally honest in our critiques. And uh, we have our moments where we get to what I like to call intellectually ratchet or ratchet intellectualism, where we are really speaking deeply about important things happening in the world and how this piece of art is impacting that or reflecting that and talk about what it really means to us as individuals and people are part of this society in 
then we go right back to be like, but F that, this is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go search this podcast as soon as, <laughs> as we're finished. And I'm going to actually drop the links in the show notes because oh, I, have to I share feel like yes, people, yes. yeah, please do. I, I uh, yeah, off. we're on hiatus right now, but we'll be back February of this year. I think the this episode's coming out before February. So this episode uh, is coming out on the 24th of January. Okay. So um yeah. yeah and then february and is, is from from february i'll have my other guests as well so yeah okay okay so yeah about february 3rd is it should be our first episode of the year um where we're coming back from a very long hiatus that i needed <laughs> podcasting is hard guys <laughs> podcasting is hardcore okay don't even I tell you, I, mm-hmm. I, I was saying somebody was like, are you going to have a guest every week? I'm like, no, I'm going to have seasons because that is all I can handle. Yes. Season two, then season two is done. I need a minute. I need a minute. And then we'll have season mm-hmm. three. That's I highly recommend here. seasons, especially if you're doing all the work by yourself. I highly recommend seasons where you can take time to reevaluate, think about, plan, and get back to and take a break and breathe <laughs> a minute to breathe yes. and also yes. step away from it like you know what you were saying about your thesis the other day like I think sometimes we actually need to step away from the things that we create yes right yes. and I think about that even with season one I, I did it I completed it. it was 11 episodes or whatever the case was and I stepped away from it and in stepping away from it I understood okay mm-hmm. this was what I wanted it to be this was what it actually was Actually, I like some of these things. I don't like some of these things. What right. am I going to do next season? How am I going to? Like sometimes you need to step away from the things that you create to get that perspective. Absolutely, absolutely. So I definitely um, agree with that. And also, I'm looking forward to your next season. And I'm going to drop all the links <laughs> down in the show notes. And so, of Thank course, you. we you know we've been talking a little bit about what you love to read. It sounds like you love to read a bit of anything speculative what's something you read recently that you uh was you'd love to you know talk about or kind of just recommend to our listeners reading has been difficult (laughs) lately like I don't know if it's the pandemic or once I finished grad school I was like ew books no thank you (laughs) she says with a bookshelf behind her that is like about to topple over on her head it really is okay just FYI all right I can see it we can all see it Kathleen don't even (laughs) this is true I mean you know reading books has nothing to do with buying books they're two very different Different activities Yes. Completely. Yes. It's like buying craft stuff is not right. the making craft. They're two oh, different if you hobbies. could see the mountain of craft stuff next to me, yeah. <laughs> like out of the camera shot. Crochet thread over there. Okay. Cloth. I, you, you, you just oh, can't listen. because of the right too much. Trust me, I live in that life too. I'm it's really ridiculous. Too. But I was like, this year, I have to get back to reading. I miss reading. And reading really helps me as a writer because it inspires me. And Mm. so it's part of my like um, creative practice is like I always read right before I write. And right now I'm reading my favorite book of all time, which is The Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake by Amy Bender. It's a magic. The Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake? Yes. All right. I actually make the world's best lemon cake. And so this is really um, interesting to me. Go. I'm listening. (laughs) So it is about this little girl who on around her ninth birthday um, discovers that she can taste the emotions of the people who are cooking in the food they cook. And it starts when she tastes her mother's depression in the lemon cake she made for her birthday. And it just go, it's a magical realism book. And so it just goes down the line of her life from that point on and trying to navigate the world and getting to know these intimate details about her family members by eating their food and things she doesn't really want to know. You know what I mean? She doesn't want to know about the things her mother's dealing with emotionally. And it's big emotions that a nine-year-old can't really comprehend but she's tasting it in her mother's food and it's make, she's crying while she's eating the cake and she can't understand why do I feel this? What's going on? What's wrong with my mother? And how is she hiding these emotions from everyone? And it's just an amazing book. And it goes down the line of discovering all of these secrets of other people in her family who have like powers and who have been hiding them all from each other and sometimes hiding them from themselves. And I love this, right. I love this story because 
it speaks to how mundane and normal a family can be, but also have this extraordinary part of it that you would think would have big impact and change everything. And the whole family is like coming together around it or something, but it just doesn't work that way. And Mm. it's just, I have read this book almost every year since I I first read it. And I love it. Every time I read it, it's a different story. (laughs) I'm going to read it. I have to tell you that is so similar to a book that I started writing, but never finished. Really write it anyway. Write it anyway. I, You'll yeah. be telling it from a totally different perspective. Uh, it. It's 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 different. Uh, I, I want I, I don't want to talk about it because I'm almost afraid to put the idea out there. But I'm like, <laughs> you're lying to me. This book exists. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have to read it, and I'm probably going to write it anyway. I think I'm going to have a number of books to write by the time we get off this call. So um, I need to get my. I want my ready. superhero book I for women my- in their 40s. I need that. I need to he- read your story about, you know, tasting emotions and food, whatever it may be. I need those stories from you. <laughs> okay. Well, I will. I'll see what I can do. I'll get those to you. <laughs> ASAP. Yes, ma'am. So I will do that. Um, so great. Well, thank you so much. Listen, we could, <laughs> I feel like we could have talked all day absolutely and it was been so good i'm probably gonna have you back i think i'm just gonna have a season like in a maybe in a year or so where it's just gonna be oh, like yeah. i'm just bringing everybody back because everybody's yeah. been on i'm like no i want you back i want you back Come the back repeat <laughs> yeah the replay let's reload yes, yes. Let's all reload that all the guests because i've had some <laughs> incredible guests that i just want to keep talking to so i hope that everybody enjoyed the conversation and i hope that you writers took away you feel like you understand the editing process a bit more remember Mm -hmm. that editors are human if i had to give any bit of advice to writer it's like remember writers are human editors are humans we are all human beings right that's why you you know you're not going to be able to work with every every editor every editor is not going to be able to work with you and as kathleen said someone's critique of your work is not a reflection on your writing absolutely it's not at all not you can be a great writer and just have written something that wasn't that great and or you can be a great writer that this person doesn't like i mean their books that i i always remember picking up this book that had like on the front it was like won all these prizes and whatever and then i was like oh no i left that book on a train in germany i was like oh no please i can't no not reading i have had that experience of thinking how how did you win these awards (laughs) it's just like just not for me i didn't like (laughs) it and that doesn't mean anything about your writing right and so as I said remember like and and one last thing I want to leave everybody with any uh, any writers who are kind of hesitant about the editing process something that I always remind myself of is every book I've ever loved has been edited that's right that is absolutely right every single one and and you would not believe the painstaking work that went into creating that book it didn't just fall out of the writer as it was on the page when you read it no there was a huge process years long in getting Mm -hmm. it to that place yes and so be patient with yourself Mm -hmm. um remember that like I always say you can't write or you shouldn't or don't write a book alone like it takes a community Mm -hmm. it takes an editor it takes somebody to lay it out and make it look gorgeous and you know it takes readers and people to you know Mm -hmm. leave reviews and like the whole community and so don't even attempt to write that book alone um yes. if you you want to partner with an editor then do mm-hmm. that find find the right person for you uh, and go right ahead and if anybody yes. thinks i'm writing this boss speculative fiction or whatever they're writing and i want i want kathleen to edit you want to get in touch with kathleen tell us how the audience can get in touch with you Oh, anywhere on the internet under Kathleen underscore Natea. That's Kathleen underscore N-A-Y-T-I-A. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I am not on Facebook. If you see me on Facebook, it's a lie. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also on TikTok. I don't create anything on there, but you can definitely send me a message on there if you want to. Or you can go to my website, KathleenNatea.com, and just send me a message on there and we can get together and work on whatever you got going. I would love to work with you. If you're out there and you're listening, I want to work with you. Come on. Yeah. And same <laughs> here. If you are writing that nonfiction book 
and you want a writing coach or an editor, give me a shout. You know where to find me. You found me here. <laughs> so you definitely know where to find me. But everything is going to be in the show notes. If you're watching us on YouTube, thanks for hanging out in our living room, bedroom, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, if you're listening to us on the podcast, please, please, please hit subscribe. If you're on YouTube. Please, please, please hit subscribe. Share it with a friend. Mm-hmm. Um, and happy writing, folks. Thanks. Yes. Bye. Bye.